in America fear their government, and the government is being run by too many powerful agencies like the IRS and others, I think it's time the people take the country back through their representative government. Welcome to Freedom TV. I'm Renee Kimball, and we have another good show for you this week. And this week we're going to be talking about my favorite topic, food, organic food. So we have two great guests that we're going to be talking to in a few minutes and how to get organics directly to you. But before we do that, we're going to be seeing a very special segment by Chris Ward on surviving and thriving. And this one is all the things you can do with simple parachute cord. I never thought that you could do all these things in a survival situation. So right now we're going to go with, to, with Chris Ward, surviving and thriving. There's only one kind of cord that I recommend for your survival kit. And that's parachute cord, also known as 550 cord. The reason I recommend it, like a lot of other things that I recommend, is because it's multi-usefulness. Inside of a casing on real parachute cord, you're going to find seven strands of inner core. Each of these inner cores is 35 pounds tensile strength more than sufficient for fishing line, for snaring, even for lashing shelters. Even the inner core is twisted. It's a three-strand twist, so you can actually separate these and get real fine thread or floss or whatever you need to use it for. Now, I generally recommend about 50 feet of this which is this little bundle right here. And with the seven strands of inner core and the casing, you're actually talking about 400 feet of usable rope. Hypothermia, which is often referred to as exposure, is far and away the number one leading cause of death in the wilderness. You simply cannot allow yourself to get wet and cold out here. The consequences are deadly. A full body size plastic bag is both a quick and effective means of keeping hypothermia from becoming a life-threatening emergency. This high density bag will easily fit in one of your back pockets. Personally, I prefer them to the much touted space blankets for a variety of reasons. They're far more durable than the basic space blanket, and they're much more accessible. You can get them over your body 10 times faster than a folded up piece of tin foil. They can also be utilized in so many different ways to save lives out here and at a fraction of the cost. These highly versatile bags can also be used to make an excellent tube tent that is as quick as it is easy to construct. First, find two trees that are at least eight feet apart. Next, cut off the end of the bag. Now, watch closely as I demonstrate how to tie a timber hitch around the trunk of this tree. 
The height's going to be about two and a half feet off the ground. It's a friction knot, so the tighter I pull it, the better it will hold. Before I tie it to the other tree, I need to pass it through the plastic bag first. The knot that I'm going to tie at this end is called a trucker's hitch. Before I bring the line around the tree, I will tie a slip knot about a foot away. Then I bring the line around the trunk and through the slip knot, and then put some muscle into it and pull it real tight. Right at the point where the line bends back through the loop, I will pinch this between my fingers to keep it from slipping. Now I form a loop. I take the loop over the taut line and then through itself, kind of like tying your shoes, and then snug it up and throw a half inch over it to keep it from slipping. With a strip of duct tape about the length of my finger, I secure one side of the plastic to the line. I'll repeat this process on the other side, stretching the bag fairly tight while making sure that the tape won't slip on the line. Before I anchor the bottom of the shelter, I will first need to cut four small stakes. I start by tying a clove hitch around one of the stakes. The four stakes will be placed about three feet apart and about a foot beyond the end of the bag. I run the line through the bag and again tie a clove hitch to the opposite side. To measure the width, I use a three foot piece of parachute cord. That's the distance between my fingertips and my sternum. This will help me to determine where the stakes will be located. Running lines all the way through the tube tent is the most effective method I have found to keep the shelter tight and secure in high wind conditions. I complete my makeshift shelter by attaching all four bottom corners the same as I did on the top. From start to finish, the tube tent should only take you about 20 to 30 minutes to construct. If you practice the timber hitch and the clove hitch, this six and a half by three foot shelter will keep you dry and out of the wind. It's a great shelter for those survivors who wait until it's dark before deciding to build one. If I want to move up in the world and make a larger shelter, I can do that. Hi, welcome back to Freedom TV and today I'm here with the organic guys. This is Chris Lantaff, Dan Thal from An Organics to You and Hood River Organics and we're going to talk about the good stuff. Food. Food and produce. Yes. Now you guys are local in the area. I think you, Dan, you come down from Washington. Hood River. Hood River area. Mm -hmm. And you're local here in the area. Locally owned and operated here. Actually, this is good. And what you do is you actually deliver the organic stuff. We home right deliver to organic right. produce to people. Yes. It's like, come on. It. It's beautiful. How beautiful. Where did, you, where did you ever get the idea that people would like to have, I mean, you know, organic veggie type people, of which I'm one, we like to go and look at our little sure. vegetables in the store. Where did you ever get the idea that they'd like them home delivered? How would you come up with well, this? Well, Renee, I hope that <coughs> I had come up with it myself, but I can't claim that. <laughs> and first of all, thank you for inviting oh, me. Oh, thank uh, you for being uh, here. I appreciate uh, it. Today. And, uh, but yeah, basically started over eight years ago, and I worked for a company that did it in Portland. And worked for them a couple of years, kind of you know learning. I did their deliveries and kind of warehouse manager type of thing, and just kind of worked from there. And then sadly, for uh, maybe not for me, but for them, uh, they went out of business. But oh. then that's when I kind of uh, came into the picture and you know expanded or changed things. Maybe not expanded, but changed things in, right. in how 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 I, I viewed how I can do it. But also uh, one of the major changes was you know, buying farm direct produce. Right. Because uh, that, that, that's what I always wanted to focus right. on, and that was one of the things that, one of the major changes that I made with when I started Organics right. to, whew, uh, over eight years ago now. You know, starting just, you know, really small with like 12 customers, and, you know, my office was my bedroom, <laughs> shared a cooler with like a, a local beer guy at the time. It was just hey, like cool. in like this basement, you know, warehouse type yeah. of thing. And now we've grown to where right. we're, you know, six in Madison. To and nice this is warehouse. basically the entrepreneurial dream. This is, you know, having an idea, starting out from the bottom, 
and building the thing that you want to do and the way you want to do it, which is really great because it allows you to build a life on something that you really believe in, yeah. which I really appreciate. And obviously, you're very close to vegetables. I mean, I, I mean am. that nicely. Sometimes too close. Sometimes <laughs> too close. To, I'm too close to vegetables. But why? Why vegetables? Why not? Um, you know, something else. Why particularly? I guess for vegetables? me, it was especially in when I was working with this company. Right. You know, I, I've been eating uh, organically, and 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 I was a vegetarian for many years. Now I I eat meat, but it's you know, okay. I know. We all see. I love it. It's actually. all right. Yeah. <laughs> but uh, so it was just something like it was like something that was right down my alley. Yeah. And when I was given the opportunity, in a sense, to open my own thing, you know, it, it started, you know, on a shoestring, you know, it wasn't like, started with, you know, lots of money, whatever, it was like right. five, six, seven, eight thousand dollars, and it was like, you know, like I said, in office in my bedroom type right. of thing, and it just kind of grew from there, right. the, you know, till two friends and so on and so on, it kind of just grew a lot from right. just people referring each other. Right. And that type of thing, and it just kind of um, blossomed. Blossomed so from what, there. What it is. Then how did you and Dan get together? How did how did you get? I mean, I'm sure you were going out to farms and picking stuff up, but how did you and Dan kind of hook up and and join together, join forces together? You've got the farm, you've got the delivery. How did this all work? Yeah, basically at the beginning, I just started going to like farmers markets and things like that, and okay. I actually looked in the Oregon Tilth Guide and just looked at all the. The farmers that had the 503 zip codes, I was like, hey, they got to be <laughs> somewhat local. <laughs> they got to be somewhere in the area. <laughs> and so I pretty much just called all those people, right. and uh, and uh, I, I, I hooked, and that's when I met Dan. He was working uh, for uh, this orchard uh, back in back in the day, way long ago. Now that was like, he was even doing it longer than I was. That was like nine, ten years ago when he was working for this uh, orchard called Pise, and uh, so I started, you know, getting some some fruit through 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 Dan right. and, and, and the orchard there and then things, you know, as they always do, the only thing constant is change. Uh, things change and right. so Dan uh, embarked on his own, uh, you know, journey and, and now he's producing right. mushrooms and working other right. relationships with different farmers right. also and uh, bringing that produce. Now Dan, do you produce a particular thing at your farm that you kind of specialize in? Yes, yes. We grow the portobellos. The portobello and mushrooms. The and yeah. I just want everybody to look at these baskets. These are gorgeous they little are works of art. They are so nice. So portobello mushrooms. Are you, so you produce the portobello the mushrooms. Portobello and, and the cremini. cremini yeah. And creminis yep. also. And in fact they're actually the same mushroom. They are. It's just a marketing are you kidding? No. They're the same mushroom. About seven to ten days, you uh, you pick them when they're young, and if they have a stout trunk, um, you say that that looks like it could be a portobello, and you sort of nourish it a little bit more, and don't harvest it obviously, and let it let it mature into a full-grown portobello. Okay. Yeah. All right. So they're actually the same. I thought they looked kind of they, alike, and I went, well, mm -hmm. maybe it's no, it can't be. It. This is a huge mushroom. You know, this <laughs> yeah. is a little. It's tiny actually mushroom. terrific for the mushroom farmer, the agaricus is what it's called in the mycological world. In the summer months, the portobello is a huge success. Everybody wants to put them on the grill. It's yeah. a one the, the sales really drop in the winter for the portobello, but the cremini, the, the, the babies, the, they, they spike. So it's this yin-yang balance between the two. And That's excellent. It is. The creminis are in stuffing and dressing and gravy all right. winter. There was yeah. a wonderful winter crop, and the yeah. portobellos are really celebrated in the summer. So Why mushrooms? Why did you get involved in mushrooms? Well, as Chris said, I was, I was working growing apples and pears, and I always asked the orchard owner for a raise all the time. <laughs> and he'd always say, not on apple and pear money. But he was always very um, willing to entertain other ideas of us growing more oh, okay. year-round. We almost did a year-round greenhouse, but we investigated and it just didn't seem like it, there's not enough sun and yeah. it's very cold and it's just difficult. Yeah. And uh, the mushrooms seemed to be a, an open niche, so um, I went for it. And Excellent. I left the orchard that I was working for, unfortunately. It was a beautiful orchard. Right. Um, but <clears throat> uh, it was just just evolution of it all. So sometimes you just get caught up in it and it just takes right. takes it with you kind of. And thing. then what, are there other things that you grow in your Yes. Farm? Well the awesome thing about growing Cremini and Portobello mushrooms is you create this incredible compost substrate mm. that they grow from 
and the mycelium is the roots of the mushrooms. And the job of mushrooms in the natural world is to take r fresh organic matter and to turn it into soil. Oh, and, okay. and that's what we're, we're doing. After we grow all our mushrooms and the beds won't produce any more mushrooms, we, uh, we grow a, a pretty large market garden with exclusively mushroom compost. Really? It's just... So that's what they mean when they say mushroom compost is the stuff that mushrooms used to There's no in. mushrooms in the mushroom oh, compost. Oh, yeah, because I always thought mushroom compost... Why are they wasting mushrooms and compost? I mean, really, yeah. you know, you eat mushrooms, you don't compost them. The, the, the mushroom compost is really a, a, a blend of manures and straw, and it's pasteurized, right. um, safe from, uh, what is it, E. coli and all of those all things. All those good stuff, all, yeah. All those, uh, Basically, virtually all the, the microbial activities zapped out of it from the pasteurization, uh, allowing the, the, the mushrooms to grow free from any competition. Excellent. But uh, once, once you put it back into Mother Nature and put it into raised beds, it quickly life, it fosters yeah. life for all kinds of microbial right. activity. It's a wonderful medium to grow all kinds of vegetables with. Excellent. Very yeah. good stuff. Well, we've got some pictures that I'd like to go to about organics to you, about right. this whole idea of delivering vegetables right to people's door, which I think is a fabulous idea. So if we can bring up the pictures, this is the first one with the logo, which I thought was really cute. I love the, and this is how I found you, was the truck driving around, which is, yeah, I just thought this was the coolest sprinters. little truck. And they also, we, we, we run our, our sprinters with, uh, with, with uh, biodiesel also. Oh, cause, really? Because they are diesel vehicles. So, oh, excellent. So That's exceptional. Those too. Very good. Diesel vehicles. And so our next little picture is the crew. There's the crew, yeah, and my two dogs. Yeah. Oh, excellent. That's so it's a, it's, a, it's, it's a fairly good number of people. Yeah, yeah. So, after eight years, I guess, you know, you get a few people in there. And, uh, it's like a dirty yeah, dozen. Th th there's, there's some uh, drivers and then the box makers pretty much. And right. Stuff and, and so you're actually scale. creating jobs here <coughs> in the Portland area. Yeah. One of the, probably one of the few businesses who actually is. <laughs> okay. And our next picture is showing some folks some actually putting it together production. in, in yeah. lines. Now, how many boxes do you actually do? Say, is it by like by the week or the day or how yeah, do you do this? Yeah, weekly. Uh, you know, we're doing a, a you know over a thousand of a deliveries thousand? a week. Oh my gosh! So each day, you know, there's you know, basically break it down the city in different parts. So oh, Monday okay. we're doing north northeast. Okay, so you break Tuesdays it down we're into doing southeast west. Don't side. want to give any your proprietary secrets yeah. away. But we're, this we're doing the west side okay. and stuff like that. Excellent. So it kind of breaks down that way. So our next one is this is actually Some and I love up. the do. Yeah. This is great. He's this guy's hair is all right. People love him for no sure. No product in that hair either. No product <laughs> in that hair. Yes, yeah, so it's product free. That's excellent. That's a great one. And so you just load up all the boxes. Yeah, kind of descending order ride. and stuff. And, and, and so when they drive up to the first delivery, their first box is, is right, right there. there. Excellent. Yeah. That's a good one. And there's a little front of the truck. I just I just think it's the cutest. The sprinters are so good. Yeah. They're, they're economical. They, they get around real great. Now, this is uh, a picture that I pulled down off the it's website. It's a rough can... map, yes. Extremely rough, I would say. But that's kind of where, and it's actually really old. I need to have that updated. But... It's kind of a rough map of uh, some of the farmers that I deal with. Because I deal with, right. during the growing season, you know, 8 to 12 different farmers. Really? Dan being one of them. Okay, excellent. So this is kind of the area. And this, yeah. again, is the whole concept <clears throat> of dealing locally with the people who produce in the area. So you have the inbuilt consciousness of not going long distances with your, your produce. And that's like I was going over earlier slightly. That's kind of our, roughly our delivery map and where we... Right. Deliver, you know, north so you're east, covering so. a specific you know, area. Pretty much, yeah. Gresham, Sandy, all the way out to Hillsboro, Vancouver, Camas, all the way down to Sherwood, right. Westland. So that, that's quite a, a territory. And you do you cross cross the border, the big river. We do which go is up to excellent. Vancouver, Camas, yeah. Excellent. Well, that's good. And this is some, some of the pictures, goodies. Yeah. We have some of the goodies here <laughs> on the on the stage. But I want. I thought these were great. And this, those are some those outrageous turnip, looking turnips. turnips. Man, yeah. I gotta tell you. <laughs> The turnip man, that's, that's really cool. Good. And these are some of the baskets that you put together. I didn't know that you yeah, put baskets I, together. Yeah, we also get into uh, gift baskets, oh, which cool. obviously during the holidays and, yeah. and certain things people go in. You know, uh, these are kind of some uh, basic pictures. You know, it changes subtly with, with the fruits right. too. And then they do get the, 
the frilly packaging and stuff too. Oh, okay. It doesn't and just come like that. Now, how much time do you need for one of these baskets? If somebody wanted to get a basket, how many days would you need to know ahead of time? Yeah, basically for service or for like a gift basket delivery, we really just need like a, a day or two really? that of quick? notice. Yeah. Cool. We, we, we can, we That's can great. Catch yes, indeed. Okay, and our next one is this is the uh, box. That's I just, one of our oh, boxes. Tasty. Which, kind of the visual, which we'll probably maybe show it later, right. is, is in the basket. And how many there. vegetables would you get, like, in a box in a delivery? Is, that does one it depend might on look what? like the small or the bin for one, which has about, let's just say, 13 to 15 different items. Really? And different amounts of those items cool. in there, a mix of fruits and vegetables and things. And then people usually get this once a week. Yeah, you can do it weekly, you can do it every other week, you can do it once a month. There's no commitment, so from there right. you can skip weeks, add weeks, you can do cancel in any time type yeah. of thing. You know. <laughs> Don't worry, we do that. And this, I pulled this down That's off. That's yeah, um, pictures from Mount Hood or Organic this, Farm. Up yeah, there. I just yeah. went, oh you, my gosh. You get all yeah, my apples I and pears. I want to live and there and stuff. eat there. This looks good. They also do weddings there. They do. Oh, excellent. And these are, I think there's some other people that, oh, this is, Danny. there we go, Hood River. <laughs> and I, I love, that's the mushroom compost. Yes. Oh, excellent. Because I, I looked at this and I, this is too good to be dirt. Oh, it's it's got to be something else. <laughs> cool. Excellent. And these are some of the other people that I found on the internet that you partnered with. I love the chickens. The chickens are good. And they then are. the family. Yes, ladies. Ladies? The chickens, yeah. The ladies. The hens. Uh, the girls. Girls. The girls. The girls. And the family, I just thought, what a, what a wholesome, I, idyllic sort of place for a family and a business to have for a family. And this one, I just uh -huh. couldn't resist. I <laughs> thought it was just so cool. Now, do you deal with particular dairies? Yeah, the, the, there's a few other things that people can also add oh, on okay. to, their, to their delivery. And Norris uh, Dairy is uh, a local dairy that we right. do get uh, their cheeses and yogurts and stuff um, but also people can add on milk, bread, eggs. We, oh, cool. You know, we deal with, you know, Nature Bacon, Dave's Killer Bread, which, you know, oh, seems to yeah, be, Dave's Killer everyone bread. loves yeah. Dave's, yeah. <laughs> and all that type of thing, yeah. Okay, and I just wanted people to see, again, these wonderful little baskets here. They're really, mm. I love the baskets because it gives you this, this sense of opulence and cornucopia, and for me, Food is a real thing for me as far as it's just one of those things I think people... Yeah, we all need it's it It's not so sure. much that people have a right to food, it's that people need access yeah, it's definitely a to need. good, it's one of the basic clean things. food. Food, water, air. Food, water, air. And it's, it's something that I w encourage people to get more involved in. Not that I cook, but, you know, I mean, other people need to cook. So we're going to take a short break right now, and we're going to go to a little short on a very appropriate topic. This is a Drew Carey short, and it's called, appropriately enough, Food Fight. Not exactly about this kind of food, but it's about another situation of food in the LA area. So with that, we're gonna to go to Drew Carey's Food Fight. Downtown Los Angeles. People head here to work, shop, and eat. There's plenty of food to be had, including this bad boy. Meet the bacon wrapped hot dog. Top it with anything you like, and you've got yourself one of LA's proudest gastronomical traditions. It tastes so good, and it's so bad for you. You might think it's illegal. Actually, it is. Welcome to the underground world of black market bacon dogs. Okay, it's not really underground. You see food carts like this all over the place, and there's bigger ones too. Some vendors will sell you an illegal bacon dog, but hardly any will talk about it. She doesn't want to talk. The owner of this cart wouldn't talk, but she responded to our questions through one of her customers, Fabiello. Two weeks ago, somebody spoke to the news, somebody in the news, and that's why they were harassed. And they're trying to get rid of them. And who, who is trying to get rid of them? Um, the health department. The vendor tells Faviella that the health department has been cracking down on bacon dog sellers. Um, they've been arrested. Um, the food is basically thrown in the trash. Everything they have, they throw it in the trash. We saw it ourselves. The cops confiscated these carts. The dogs were dumped. <laughs>
and then the carts tossed into the garbage truck. Now, why in the world would officials want to mess with something that's so delicious? It all starts with the salty strip that wraps around the hot dog. Uh, doing bacon is illegal. Elizabeth Palacios is one of the few vendors willing to speak publicly. I used to do that before, but uh, health department doesn't allow that. She's been selling bacon dogs and other food for about 20 years. She pays taxes and is required to have three different kinds of permits. City permits, health department permits, and border equalization permit. She's used the money she's made to raise her daughter, buy a car, and a house. No, I love to sell. This is my life. I like to be with customers, to talk to them. I feel proud of myself. But with run-ins with the health department and police officers, Palacios worries about the future. She says she loses business if she doesn't give customers the bacon they demand. They, they want bacon. They want to bottle with bacon. It just gives it like an oomph, just, just extra, extra taste, the crispiness of the bacon, and just the flavors together. It's just wonderful. Bacon is a potentially hazardous food. Terrence Powell of the L.A. County Health Department. Potentially hazardous foods, by definition, are those foods that, if not uh, kept within certain limits, whether it be temperature or, um, or pH control, acidity, would allow for the growth of harmful bacteria that would get you sick. So how many people are getting sick from these bacon dogs? That's kind of a nebulous number. We don't know how many cases of food sickness come from eating out versus eating at home, so no one really knows if these dogs are dangerous. But Powell says customers expect food to be safe. That they're not going to be locked up in the restroom at home because they ate a hot dog that was improperly cooked or improperly stored. Well said, Terrence. Our cameraman, Alex, bravely agreed to an experiment that would test the bacon dog's effect on the human body. Actually, Alex was wolfing down dogs long before we aimed the cameras at him, but we'll still give him credit for advancing science. We'll check on Alex later. Gee, I hope he's okay. But Powell says that Palacios can sidestep this controversy and sell bacon dogs legally. How? Get rid of her old cart and buy a sleek new one like this that comes with new features like a three compartment sink. So that you can wash, rinse, and sanitize any of the equipment that's being used, utensils and the like. The new car cost is like 26000 How I can afford it? The new cart is about five times as expensive as the cart Palacios has now. But if she sells bacon dogs without it, she faces the inevitable stiff consequences. It's $1,000 or six months in jail, um, and we will summarily take individuals to court if they violate the law. They took Palacios to court about a year ago after catching her cooking bacon dogs. I have to pay a lawyer. The judge sentenced her to 45 days in jail. It was a black day for me. Meanwhile, Alex is still downing dogs with no ill effects, and we didn't find anyone who has gotten sick from bacon dogs. I never got sick. I never gotten sick, and you know, I think the people that sell hot dogs really helping us. But we are in the business of preventing people from getting sick, and we will do that. Of course, it is possible that the bacon hot dogs might have made some people sick. But in addition to what might have happened, maybe, shouldn't we also consider what we know for sure is happening to people like Elizabeth Palacios? So all that money is getting me behind my bills. And right now I'm broke. I'm still broke, almost one year. One year after getting busted, she's still deep in debt from paying attorney's fees and fines. And because she was unable to work, for 45 days. It is like really, really amazing that over 12 months I've been laying on my mortgage. Now she worries that she'll lose her house and points to the vendors with the tiny carts. They do a lot of more money than I do. She says if she doesn't sell bacon dogs, customers will buy from them. And you don't have to be Ben Bernanke to know that she's right. And they said, do you have bacon? And I said, no. They said, oh, thank you. And they called with whoever had bacon. She loses money, and the goal of protecting consumers doesn't turn out the way officials wanted, shock, because unlike Elizabeth, these vendors aren't licensed at all. They don't care about if you're cleaner, if you don't have license, if you don't have a license to handle the food. They just want the bacon. That's right, Elizabeth. They just want the bacon. For Reason.TV, I'm Drew Carey.
Hi, welcome back to Freedom TV, and we're here talking about organics to you and Hood River Farm with Chris and Dan. And I just, I just love your products. I think they're wonderful because they're so wholesome. I mean, it's something that everybody loves. I, I don't know anybody who doesn't eat food. I don't know a single person who doesn't eat food. Yeah. And organic food to me is something very special because it allows people to have a much healthier relationship with what's coming out of the ground. And also, it doesn't have stuff in it yeah. that's maybe not the best for you. Now, how do you guys work? You were mentioning on the break about you don't just bring in the mushrooms. What else do you bring in well, to him at the same time? As ever, most people know, the Hood River Valley is just extremely, uh, it's a historically a, a big agricultural center. Yeah, so food central. Yes. <laughs> and uh, we have just about everything you can grow up here from the Hood River Valley. And luckily, more and more farmers are switching over to organic practices. Right. So we have... In the summer, everything from blueberries, peaches, and nectarines, and, and vegetables from the garden. Really? They do peaches in the Hood River? Oh, yes. Oh, I didn't it's know the, that. The best Saturn peaches in the world really? from Ken Newman's farm. Is, and also Red Havens from up in Parkdale, just really good late peach. Ooh, um, yeah. Nectarines, too, yeah. And the, it is famous for the apples and pears, but right. more and more blueberry acreage is going in, in really? all the time. Yeah. That's interesting. Yeah. And... Uh, yeah, it's it's gaining steam. A lot of farmers, traditional farmers that in the past wouldn't have thought twice about organic are, are thinking twice. Right. Economically is a good reason, but also there's a lot of uh, other benefits going on. I think there's some, some grants to pay for transition to get certified into organic, right. which is also terrific. Right. And so, yeah, we try to load up our van for economic reasons, too. Right. If we're going to go into Portland, we might as yeah. well just have it filled to the rim and we have so many farmers in the in the in the valley so it's easy to fill yeah. up the van and, and you're all working together you, you know you're using the one vehicle so it's for me it's not so much in uh, and a situation of sustainable because for me that word doesn't mean anything it's like pull a word out of thin air and call it whatever you want to do it's it's all about waste it's wasting space wasting time so true wasting fuel so you're you're consolidating from the aspect of being able to work together to bring stuff in all together to this location and you disperse it out to other people so it's it's really a very short distance for food yeah, and a wide miles, distribution of really important things so why if you guys had to s uh, sum up why you got into this what was the thing that really drove you to be involved with food what is the, well, the, the I guess attraction? One thing, you know, I, I eat it and I, I like it and I figure, you know, uh, it is our fuel and yeah. it's like anything else. You put a poor fuel in your right. in the system and you're not going to react as, 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 as well as you should. Right. So, you know, that's partly it, you know, kind of lifestyle type of uh, choices and stuff I make. You know, it was just a, something that was like when given the opportunity, it was like, oh my, well, I'm, I'm going to grab hold of this and yeah and ride ride and ride into the sunset right but, and uh, the thing that that interests me of uh, uh, people your age is you hear a lot of times of well they're they're very materialistic and they want to have high paying jobs because they want to have all the benefits <laughs> and what i'm seeing is there's a whole group of people who have just turned that. this around and gone you know the high techie thing is really kind of cool but it doesn't give you a sense of satisfaction. And I get the feeling from what you're doing that you're satisfied. Yeah, you know, it makes me think right now, like even uh, Dan himself and then all the other farmers that I work with during the whole year and the growing season, because we do do it all year round. You know, during the growing season, everything in the box will be local and a good, at least 75% of that will be farm direct. Right about now, right. where I'm dealing about 50 or so percent local. You know, right. the apples and pears we've talked about, you know, a lot of the root crops, the beets, you know, potatoes, onions, those type of things, right. uh, getting locally, th th those turnips and right. those type of and things. And those are things that are grown locally now at this time of the year? Now. Oh, really? Like, there's there's going to be certain things, you know, it does, there is definitely a seasonal approach. But people right now are also seeing citrus because it is a seasonal item. It's not a locally produced item, but right. it's coming out of, you know, they're coming out of, of, of California, but basically like... The satsumas, which we do, we, we, right. we're out of now, but you know, blood oranges, things like things like that. I've actually developed another another relationship with a 
individual down in California who's working with a, right. a few farmers down there. So I'm getting essentially almost farm direct citrus and stuff from right. some far farmers down in California right. too. So there is kind of a, a, a little bit of a network for things like, okay, let's be honest, I like oranges in the winter. Oh, yeah. And guess what? They don't grow here in the winter. So if I'm going to get oranges, obviously and they're going to have to come from somewhere Organic else. Stew also works with a farmer employee owned business called Organically Grown. So they're the ones that are bringing in some of the California produce oh, okay. to me. So, and so even right. when I am buying you know, some California citrus or even California lettuce right now, these local farmers are still seeing right. direct results from those purchases too. Right. So, you're so it not keeps the money locally in that way. Right. And you're not seeing this big, let's bring it in from everywhere all over the world, shove it in a warehouse and then pass it out to everybody, which is it's efficient from one standpoint, but inefficient from another standpoint because you don't have this direct connection and you aren't working with individuals. You're working with large groups of people. And that's the difference with organic stew is, 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 is yeah. you know, people are getting that direct connection to where their right. food is coming from. And that, that's whole, you know, really important. You know, you're eating the same food that is growing from the same water and the same air that you're breathing. Right. You know, those, those type of things even... You know, right. So that effect. has ha, I've heard about that, and mm. I I haven't paid too much attention to it because for me food is wonderful. It's sure. even better when no, somebody yeah. else cooks it, especially if it's guilt free. <laughs> you know, if you yeah. eat food without guilt, that yes. is almost almost high as I, yeah. I feel. You know, and what? Oh, so there is some of this evidence that eating food in your local area. I've heard that there's some kind of um, thing with allergies that if you eat food that's more local. Mm -hmm that it has a tendency to immunize you to things like hay fever. Have you? I certainly not no, uh, you know, scientist or <laughs> haven't really got into it that much, but it's just a kind of a belief that I have yeah. that, you know, eating foods in your area, you know, does make you more of a healthier individual and eating more of a diverse, uh, different amounts of food, you know, that's kind of what organics can do, can do also. When I bought my own produce from the grocery store, let's say, you know, I have a cooler full of it now, so I don't go to no grocery store. But <laughs> nonetheless, you know, I would buy my, my same things, my potatoes, my carrots, my onions, my celery, right. and garlic, and that's pretty much all I'd eat. So with organic stew, you're going to get this wide assortment of different types of produce. And, right. you know, in a sense, it's not a scientific thing also, but it's my belief that, you know, it makes you yeah. a healthier individual because you're having more right. a diverse diet in your belly, and that can produce, you know, all those different right. types of Right, and a things. lot of it, there's been a lot of evidence that, what the truth is is kind of shaped by what you believe the truth is. Like I said, by and eating, eating guilt-free, I think it's yeah. highly important. You if know. you believe that you're, you know, this is, then it's going <laughs> to react in, inside your system, mm -hmm. and so that's going to have so the same results. It's so like true. you can talk to kids, and if you keep telling a kid, "Oh, you can do it, you can do it, you can do it," the kid's going to be able to do it. But if you keep telling the kid you're a failure. Well, I can pretty much guarantee that they're going to fail Can't very spectacularly failure. for very, you. Very and true. I imagine it's the same thing with food. Although, for me, organic has the extra added advantage that you do know that there are not toxic chemicals on well, your food. Well, that's the thing I was going to say, Renee. Yeah. Uh, with also, it's, and I, I hear from, from, from customers, you know, they'll email me or, or through, through a phone call or something, and right. they'll be like, oh, you know, it, it gets their, their, their kids excited about produce, too. Like, right. families will tell me all across the board, like, you know, their, their 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 son or daughter will rip open a box and, you know, grab an yeah. apple and eat it. Or yeah. this, uh, this one lady emailed me, and the, the kid was eating some of the snow peas we had during in the summer. Cool. And she's like, I didn't even know he ate snow peas. It's like, <laughs> you know, it's like That's so, great. so it does yeah. get you know the family and you know the, the children excited about yeah. produce too. And the thing I like is I did this years and years years and years ago in Australia. Believe it or not, mm. uh, Australia is, was one of the first places all year round, yeah. I've. Places. I ever heard of that actually had delivery of organic vegetables. And I think this was almost 20 years ago. And it was like getting a little present. Christmas. Every, oh, I hear that talk you know, all the time. It's, it's like, like a little Christmas box. gift each week. Exactly. You know, That's which great. is really kind of cool. Up, yeah. And this is, I, I'd like people to have a look at these. These are the Christmas presents, which I think are really good. And this is this is representative. The small basket here is representative yeah, of like, small box that so that would be like what one person would get? or, or yeah, It's kind of a one to three or so. You know, there's different types of people. And, and people can do this either weekly or every other week, too. Right. And then we also right. have larger boxes and, and, and a smaller box, too. And then there's all fruit and all veggie boxes. And then there's a box that we have that's called the Kid Bin. And that one's more heavy fruit, but 
and the veggies you're going to get are more like you know potatoes, right. celery. Carrots, so you can you can mix and match it and make different yeah. kinds of combinations. So you don't have to say what is, well that's different than Australia. Australia yeah. is like you got what you got. That's and the thing that I was should it. mention. <laughs> yeah, definitely, people with our service can yeah. have a standing order of things I never want. Like I never want this, this, and this. Oh, okay. But then even on a weekly basis. Maybe I've been killing you with too many potatoes. Yeah. Maybe you just went to the gorge and got some apples or whatever. Right. You went berry picking or you got a little backyard garden that's got some tomatoes and zucchini growing. Yeah. You can be like, this week or this month, we don't need these items. Yeah, kill the zucchini. And, and, you know, <laughs> our garden is busting out, you know, so, yeah. so you can kind of right. work it that way and not get things you want and get more of the stuff you do want. That's excellent. That's really good. And then we've got the large basket over here. This is Incredible. Now, this changes through the season also? Definitely. As, there's certain things, yeah. like, let's just go back to the fruits. There's certain things you're not going to see, let's say, in the summertime, because, let's say, apples and pears, right. they're coming out of New Zealand and Argentina, so I'm not going to buy yeah. those types of produce. <laughs> that's not exactly local. <laughs> yeah, that's not local, so I'm not going to buy those products. Yeah. You're only going to see those products when I can get them locally. Right. But then, henceforth, during the summer also, you're going to be seeing just more, like, yeah, stuff like berries and peaches and plums and nectarines we were talking about earlier, you know, cherries right. and those type of things. And you're not going to see, you know, the those type of things. But then in the winter, you're not going to see the peaches, plums, and nectarines because they're coming out of right. you know, New Zealand, Argentina. New also, Zealand, so. Argentina. So I'm not going to so be buying those type of things. Having those things. Yeah. But with the mushrooms, hey, they're all year round. All year round. round. You can so have you can, mushies yeah. all the time. Yeah. This is really mm -hmm. cool. And th what's really interesting, how long has it been since people have been doing portobello mushrooms? Because it was, to me, it's like all of a sudden, wow, portobello mushrooms arrived. And I so went, true. Cool. I, I have an article in my office up, st stuck on to the, the wall there, and it says it was really just a, uh, a marketing thing that came on in the 1980s, and it was really a, uh, a blessing for mushroom farmers because it did offer a, yeah. a different, and especially with the rise of vegetarianism, the, the portobello is a sort of a, a naturally made veggie burger. Ready yeah. to go. Just and it's and it's got a great texture. It I does. Mean, I'm a meat eater, so hey, you know, I'm into the meat. Sorry about that. Marinated. Marinated, they're great. Yes. Yeah. Great. And yes. we actually, we had um, a um, corned beef that we get from New Seasons, mm. and we always have the juice stuff left over from the corned oh, beef. Oh, that'd be a great meal. You throw in the portobello mushrooms, and it's like, hey, we're having corned beef all Chefs over again. Chefs love yeah. cremini and portobello mushrooms yeah. because they really are like sponges and you can add any herbs rosemary or thyme and really change really? the a, a, a flavor of, of them so you can really uh, it's so versatile in so many dishes and we do sell our cremini's and portobello's to quite a few restaurants here really? in portland Excellent. bijou cafe right. the, um, farm cafe cafe mingo a um, lot of great local long-standing right. restaurants well, we're going to c come back and we're going to talk a little bit more about some of the stuff that you guys continue growing, at, especially the, I call it herbs. I don't say herb because there's an H there. Herbs, I can spend too much time in Australia. They call it with an H, so they're herbs. I like herbs. Sorry. <laughs> we're going to talk a little bit more about those, but we're going to take another short break, and we're going to go to my favorite man, Ron Paul. And we're going to hear from him. This is a little funny video that uh, someone I know put together. And it's called Ron Paul at the Zoo. And he was reelected in Texas, so now he is still at the zoo. So sit back, relax, enjoy a cute little video, Ron Paul at the Zoo. Side by side, fighting over who's gonna take you for a ride. Dark horse gallops up to join the brawl. He's fighting for the people, and his name is Ron Paul. He's the only candidate who speaks his mind, and he knows he works for you. Drive to the 
the local zoo. You can watch all the monkeys, all the TV news. Talking in circles, hoping no one's seen. The half ton gorilla in the middle of the screen. Cause when the Ron Paul juggernaut comes to town, well, you know. Welcome back to Freedom TV, and we're here with organic food. Oh, I'm so happy. Now, one of the things I wanted to talk to you guys about was, yeah, you said f fruits and vegetables, and then I looked over at you and you're saying, rosemary, hey. So you do the herbs also. Yeah. Oh, really? Even this week upcoming, people are going to get a mix of uh, some, some herbs in most of all the, ba all, all the boxes that we're doing this upcoming week. So th they'll get a mix of some Rosemary, some sage, some, really cool. Some, some basil <clears throat> and uh, some thyme. Those aren't necessarily, uh, you know, locally produced right now. I'm getting right. some of those out of California. But they will the moment, be soon. But, but they will be real soon. Really? So cool. it, it's kind of a tell kind of a, 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 a little tease of. Yeah. Uh, now what? Are you, of, what have you been nagging? What has he been nagging you about? Uh, about doing some urban gardening because oh, okay, cool. organic stew is you know farm. where oh, okay. we're you know urbanly located, but doesn't mean we still can't produce produce right and exactly. so you know rooftop gardening I even you know have some big windows I, I could you know some skylights I could cool. do some skylight growing even but Excellent. yeah some rooftop gardening and do some things like herbs uh, some you know some salad mixes and things like that yeah, just kind of boutique greens you know, to keep things <laughs> I call more well rounded and, 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 uh, and to you Excellent. know and Dan you were talking about in the break about a, a, a horrible paradigm that nearly happened here in Oregon tell me a little bit about that well um, I think our country became complacent more and more on California growing all of our produce. Right. And we always put it that it would happen tomorrow or in 10 years from now. But right now, today, California is facing serious water problems. Right. Um, land is ex extremely expensive, um, energy problems. Uh, it's high time we start gardening in our backyards and right. also looking around to our, our neighborhood farmers and farms and saying, hey, look, we." We don't want the big semi truck coming up from California, filling our grocery stores and filling right. our cupboards and our and our refrigerators. Right. We we want our food local, and for a variety of reasons, for economic reasons, right. political reasons. If it comes sustainable, closer, if it comes from closer, it's going to be cheaper. You're not going to be you know, correct. Every mile that it travels adds cost to the food. There is a weird dynamic though that I've encountered. There's actually times when I've paid more. To a local farmer, yeah, then I course. could get it from, <clears throat> uh, yeah, absolutely from my supplier. That's and, the mass production. But, but, but I'll, yeah. I'll do that because that's 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 yeah. part of my mission. And and that's part of it is people have to start mm. making conscious decisions as to what's you know, more important. We as consumers, that's where yeah. we have the power is through where we put our where money. we put our money. I mean, I go to New Seasons, I buy most of my stuff at New Seasons. New Seasons has a department where I can buy cards. No. I march down the street and I go to Branches, which is the local card store, and I buy my cards at the card Sorry. store. I go to the pharmacy and I buy my Band-Aids. 
and I buy my food at the food store. So it, it is a conscious decision. Yes, it's going to be a few more pennies. It is going to be a little bit more cost, but there's there's this added extra advantage, which even economic, the economic situation today and some of the economists are starting to get the idea of what are called externalities. And I've talked to a few of them who are seriously hardcore people, and they do understand that there is a cost to me of having somebody walk in and say, hey, hi, Renee, how are you doing today? I found a card for you that I'm willing to pay for. So there, this cost is, penny, it's, I call it penny-wise and pound-foolish. To me, that's the pounds, is having somebody, a relationship to the person that I'm actually buying things from. And I think we have a caller. Do you have a question for our guest today? Yes, I was wondering what, uh, what are the top three reasons your customers give uh, for using your service? That's it, thank you. Top reasons that somebody wants to use Top you. reasons. Um, for my business, I would say knowing uh, we're locally owned and operated, we focus on local farm direct produce and even the other groceries right. that people can add on their uh, a local lo locally owned business that we're you know purchasing and, and working those relationships with and uh, just the diversity that you're going to get with uh, the service the flexibility right. you know you're not locked into any particular thing so you know just that diversity and and, and the connection to uh, the local farmers I know the, every, every farmer that I that I work with you know, they just love that Organic Stew is here because for them it's right. just it's a resource that they have to, you know, to in a sense unload a lot of their produce. Yeah. And, and it's, I, it's I feel blessed that I can offer that to yeah. them too, you know. And, there, and it, it, to me it's really important because you do have this sense of connection with the people that you're dealing with and you feel very, when I go to my local store, I feel like I'm supporting my neighborhood and I'm supporting the people that I feel in connection with rather than just going down to some huge Fred Meyer and buying from a store that, you know, I glaze over when I walk down the aisle because I can't figure owned out what Kroger. aisle am I in. You know? No longer locally owned Fred yeah. Meyer. Yeah, and, and the thing is that I don't shop there, not because I don't appreciate Fred <coughs> Meyer and I don't appreciate the lower prices, but I don't want to walk in an aisle and glaze over because I don't even know what town I'm in and I'm going. <laughs> I went in there looking for a simple bottle of mineral oil. It took me 25 minutes to find the mineral oil because nobody in the store knew where the mineral oil was. Well, now, yeah, the, even and the other store is going to be I can go to Brooklyn Pharmacy, and I walk up, and I speak directly to the pharmacist and say, where's your mineral oil? And he hands it to me. I mean, I've just saved 20 minutes right there, and I've had this relationship and with the person. That's the thing. The you know, is, is I figure life is it, essentially it's a, a lot of it's just all about relationships. Right, exactly. You know, a relationship to people, to community to our, our, our economy to wh whatever you want to make the analogy to and it's basically these relationships that you know we, we develop through our lives and and that's what I strive to do with my business is is build and develop these relationships right you know with, with farmers like Dan and others that I deal with and other business owners that I deal with and just you know my, my customers in the community at large and you know organic stew you know donates even a lot of produce and we pretty much have zero even produce waste because we're donating a lot of you know like the right. brew stuff to like different organizations and groups Excellent. like food not bombs like kind of lo low-key like underground kind of groups even uh, to and then even like some of the other scraps uh, we're giving to uh, a farmer who feeds it to their cows right. and to their chickens yeah. and so you know the cycle continues the cycle right so the cycle con continues yeah. and you don't have this waste and you have the the sense of fulfillment knowing that w what you're doing is, I don't like the word sustainable, but it's self-fulfilling, and it's also self-reliant. Closing you're the not, circle. You're not relying on other people to get rid of your waste. And most people don't realize that n there was no such thing as garbage collection until the early 1900s. Yeah, because... The, before that... Composting. There was people... No, actually, burning. there were people who came around and got your stuff. There was a tin man who came around and got the tin. There was a rag man who came around and got the rags and the paper. There was a person who came around and got the garbage. There was a person who came around and got everything that came wow. out of your household. And so the concept of waste... Talk about jobs. Look at all those yeah, jobs we could have. Yeah, started when people 
started having this big can in front of their house and dumping everything into everything, this can. And this can took off and it went down the road to who knew where. Yeah. And it disappeared. And so this consciousness of getting rid of stuff started not that long ago, in the early 1900s. Huh. So I didn't know that. No. And, and I mean, we're talking, we're only talking like three not even full generations, maybe two full generations that we have been accustomed to this getting rid of waste mentality. Yeah. And I hate to say it, it it's all started recent. because the government decided that it was much more efficient and it was much more sanitary for people to put all their stuff in this garbage can and have it hauled away than to have all these terrible entrepreneurial people running around and yeah, it's just totally creating chaos. jobs. Creating jobs and I you know, there's no controlling them, there's no licensing them. Everybody is going you know, of course people have been doing this for centuries, uh -huh. but all of a sudden there was a problem. Hmm. So we have just a I think a couple minutes one minute left. Yes, we have one minute left here. And one thing I'd like to I like to ask people before I, I let them go from my program is if you had one thing that said why you do this that gives you the most satisfying feeling what is the one thing that keeps you going doing this both of you I guess for me I kind of already tapped into it a little bit it's kind of just that the relationships and and you know knowing you know from where the food is coming from and, and the relationship of dealing with with the farmers and then the relationship I have with my Member customers type type of thing. It's just Excellent. like those Excellent. are things Stand. I don't want to give. Uh, very you similar, think? you know, uh, on the farming farming aspect as a farmer, uh, the connection to the land and um, just that whole sort of romanticized idea of uh, the, we all have to choose to do something. We all have to work, and, and and for me to to be a part of food production, I just I can't really uh, think up of anything more. Um, gratifying really especially healthy organic excellent food excellent well thank you both for being here i really you, appreciate Renee. you being on the show and i really appreciate what you do so thanks and i hope sometime to bring you back on the show and we'll see you oh. again we hope and to next be, yeah. week we're going to be having apple seed projects tune in for that one very important people they're going to be talking to you about the history of the militia getting a rifle, learning how to use it, and why you should. So again, we'll see you next week, Freedom I TV. For my country, for the pain that it's been through. She's been made to suffer. For the profit of a few. Storm clouds are out forming. Winds of change now touch our shores. Our hear forefathers are crying as the dreams been cruised. America.